So the passage we're reading is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 8 through to chapter 10 and verse 4. The Lord has sent a word against Jacob, and it will fall on Israel. And all the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and in arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. But the Lord raises the adversaries of resin against him and stirs up his enemies. The Syrians on the east and the Philistines on the west devour Israel with open mouth. For all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. The people did not turn to him who struck them, nor inquired of the Lord of hosts. So the Lord cut off from Israel head and tail, palm and branch and reed in one day. The elder and honoured man is the head, and the prophet who teaches lies is the tale. For those who guide this people have been leading them astray, and those who are guided by them are swallowed up. Therefore, the Lord does not rejoice over their young men and has no compassion on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is godless and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It kindles the thickets of the forest. They roll upward in a column of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is scorched. The people are like fuel for the fire. No one spares another. They slice meat on the right, but are still hungry. They devour on the left, but are not satisfied. Each devours the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh devours Ephraim, and Ephraim devours Manasseh. Together, they're against Judah. For all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees, and the writers who keep writing oppression, to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil, that they may make the fatherless their prey. What will you do on the day of punishment, in the ruin that will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains but to crouch among the prisoners or fall among the slain. For all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. It's a very hard passage, but we thank God for all his word and all his truth. Well, we're very grateful to Stephen for leading our service this morning and for taking us through that long reading from the Word of God. If you've not been with us recently, you maybe won't know that we've been working our way through these early chapters of the book of Isaiah. And we come this morning to that section that we read earlier, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 8, down to Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 4. You may like to have it open with you as we come to consider God's word this morning. Perhaps we ought to start with a word of background so that you know where we're going to and coming from. Here is a map of the Near East at the time of, at the time of Isaiah. We're roughly 740 years before the coming of Christ. We know little about, very little about this man. His name means the Lord is salvation. But we do know that he was the prophet sent by God 
to the southern kingdom of Judah, that is the southern kingdom of God's people, whose capital city was Jerusalem. His ministry began in about the year 740, the year that King Uzziah died, and it carried on for a very long time through the reigns of Jotham, and then the startlingly contrasted reigns of King Ahaz, who was a godless man, and Hezekiah, his son, who was a very godly man. As I recorded the life of Hezekiah, so we know that he must have been around when Hezekiah died in 686 BC. So Isaiah was a minister for God for something like 50 years. The prophecies of Isaiah are set against a backdrop of an ascendant Assyrian empire. You'll see from the map that they were beginning to stretch out in all directions. And they were eventually to become a very great threat to the smaller nations around them, to the extent that they nearly engulfed the entire Near East, as we would call it, from Ur of the Chaldees down to Ararat in Egypt. You might think that Israel, the northern kingdom of God's people, and Judah, the southern kingdom, were very much in the firing line. Certainly they were small nations, and their people were in the minority in the ancient world. Had they but grasped hold of the promises of God and been faithful to him, they would have had no need to fear the might of Assyria. But they were not faithful to God, the God who had delivered them from captivity in Egypt, the God who had fulfilled every one of his promises to them, to give them a wonderful land of their own and to be a worldwide witness to them. So there is the historical context and we are there with Isaiah, somewhere around 730, maybe 735 BC, in the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, that comprised just two of the 12 tribes of the original people of God. But actually, this message that we've read today refers not to the southern kingdom of Judah, but to the northern kingdom of Israel. And you'll see there in the verse that started our reading, verses 8 and 9, that the Lord sent a word against Jacob, that was their forefather, and it will fall on Israel, that's the name by which Jacob became known by God, and all the people will know Ephraim, that's the chief tribe in that area, and the inhabitants of Samaria, that's their capital city. So here are these words giving us no doubt whatsoever to whom Isaiah is addressing his ministry. These different names only serve to emphasize the people he had in mind. I suppose in just the same way this morning we could say that we are sitting here in Odeby, in the East Midlands, in England, in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom, and nobody would have any doubt that we were talking about this particular location. Spiritually, the context is also very interesting. In the Northern Kingdom, um, there were a series of 20 kings. The first one, Jeroboam, was appointed by God, but did not keep God's commandments. And every one of the kings who followed him followed suit. Every one of them is recorded as doing evil in the sight of the Lord and allowing the worship of the true God to be diluted, debased, and abandoned. The kings and their people were entirely to blame, but God had graciously given them every encouragement and incentive to repent, to honor him, to remember his mercies to them in the past, to renounce their false gods, and to return to the worship of the true God. The message was delivered loud and clear by Elijah, by Ele Elisha, by Amos, by Hosea, and even here by Isaiah. But the people of Israel, taking their lead from their godless leaders, simply did not listen. Last week, we ended our session by looking at a most wonderful promise. It's at the end of um, section verses 1 to 7 in Isaiah 9. And there, God promises redemption, consequent upon the birth of a child, a most wonderful child whose name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
but immediately the focus changes from the love of God to the anger of God, about which we've heard a little already this morning. And you'll notice a repeated refrain. Did you spot that? It's at the end of verse 12. For this, his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. It's there again in verse 17 and 21 and chapter 10 and verse 4. In 1940, on the 13th of June, the order was given out on the wireless that church and chapel bells must not be rung, except to warn of imminent or actual invasion. And here, the words of Isaiah ring out just as somber a tone as would have those bells rung out had they been rung to indicate that an invasion was threatened. So let's look at the constituent notes of this little prophecy. And there are four of them, and we'll look at them in turn. Here's the first one. You'll find it in chapter 9, verses 8 to 12. We could think of various titles of this, but I've chosen this one, The Futility of Pride. The situation's uncertain. If you look there, you'll see that in verse 10, we read, The bricks have fallen but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores, or if you have an NIV, the fig trees have been cut down, but we will put up cedars in their place. We don't know what the situation was. That's uncertain. Perhaps there was a natural disaster, an earthquake or something like that. Perhaps there was an invasion. We've seen on the television recently the utter destruction as the Russian forces have invaded Ukraine. Maybe that's what happened. And so the bricks fell and the trees were cut down. But if, if the situation was uncertain, the reaction of the people was not. Did you notice that? In verses 10, verse 10 again, the bricks have fallen down, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will build put cedars in their place. And Isaiah says, we can sum this up in two words. It's there in verse nine. They're talking in pride and in arrogance of heart. The root of their problem was their self-confidence. So whatever the calamity had been, they simply didn't learn from it. They thought that they were masters of their own destiny and they were arrogant. Rebellious pride, which refuses to depend upon God, but relies entirely on self, is at the very heart of sin. We used to say to the children, didn't we, that the centre of the word sin is the letter I. The centre of sin is I. And that's exactly what we see here. The people saying, don't worry about the fallen buildings. We will build better. Don't worry about the fallen trees. We will put in better stock. How foolish they were, because opposed to the pride of men was the power of God. And we see at the end of this little section that the Lord raises the adversaries of Rezin, he was the king of Damascus, against him and stirs up his enemies. The Syrians on the east, or if you have the NIV, the Aramaeans, it means the same. And the Philistines on the west devour Israel with open mouth. For all this, his anger, the anger of the Lord, has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. So, says Isaiah, your current best friend, Aram, Syria, lying northeast of the Sea of Galilee, to whom you turn to form a kind of alliance against the Assyrians, they will be subject to these adversaries. And you yourself, well, there are the Syrians, the Aramaeans on your eastern flank, the Philistines who have always been a thorn in your flesh on the west, and they will simply devour you. There will be nothing left. The futility of human pride. Don't we see it all around us, maybe even in our own hearts? We say three things, really, in our pride. 
We need not heed God's warning. We hear what he says, but we don't need to take any notice of it. He won't really judge us. He won't really bring his wrath to bear upon us. He won't really punish us for doing wrong. We need not heed his warning. And then we said, we say, we need not seek his help. We can build where things have been ruined. We can plant where things have been cut down. We can make good what has been destroyed. We do not need the help of God. We have the abilities, the resources, the wisdom, the knowledge, everything we need to make a go of it. We do not need his help. And ultimately, not only we need not heed his warning, we need not seek his help, but we need not fear his judgment. It just isn't going to happen. We don't need to worry. And says Isaiah, pride and arrogance, how foolish you are to think that you can do without God, that you can ignore God, and that you can dismiss the judgment of God, because there will come the day when you will be devoured by those to whom you've turned for help and who will become your enemies. So we see in that first section the futility of pride. The second section we're going to look at is section not verses 13 to 17. And I've, I've headed this, the folly of wisdom. It seems a, an oxymoron, doesn't it? The folly of wisdom. But that's what we find here. The Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, palm branch and reed in one day. He's talking about here followers and leaders, the high reaching fronds of the palm, the low growing rush, the most and the least considered of God's people. And the Lord says he will cut off from them, from Israel, these people. The Lord does not rejoice in them. For everyone is godless and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. Yes, there's the problem. Every mouth speaks folly. And if you want to sum up the folly, then we got it there in verse 13, that they do not inquire of the Lord of hosts. They're not interested in what God says. They're going to rely on what they can consider, what they can think, what they can deduce. They're going to rely on human wisdom, certainly not on the wisdom of God. Jeremiah was the great prophet who spoke to that northern kingdom. And this is what he says in Jeremiah chapter 14. The prophets say, you shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine. But I will give you assured peace. And the Lord said, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, although I did not send them, and who say sword and famine shall not come upon this land. By sword and famine, these prophets shall be consumed, and the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out, victims of famine and sword, with none to bury them, for I will pour out their evil upon them. So they weren't the people of Judah, uh, Israel, in want of advice, in want of prophecy, in want of guidance. There were many who were seeking to talk to them, to lead them and to guide them. But they were false prophets. And the falsity came because they did not inquire of the Lord. The folly of human wisdom. By contrast, if you want a good Bible study, look up in your concordance. The, often, the times that often David inquired of the Lord. That was one of the great secrets of his success. He was a man who inquired of the Lord. And he was not unique in that. Do you remember that lovely occasion when Joseph had, been, uh, made, had made himself known to his brothers and they'd gone back to Canaan to fetch their father? 
and he determined that he would go down to Egypt and see his son, the son he hadn't seen for so many years and who he had thought was dead. And we read this, Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba, the southernmost city of the people of God, and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, I am God, the God of your fathers. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you a great nation. Why did he say, do not be afraid? Well, because the old man was afraid. And that's why he offered sacrifices in worship there. He wanted to know if this move, this rather dramatic move from the land of promise to the land of Egypt was a move he could make in good conscience. Was it something that God was calling him to or not? And so he sacrificed. He inquired of the Lord. We'll read later, but not in this series of sermons, when we get to Isaiah chapter 37, um, we find that we have the record of what happened in the days of King Hezekiah, a man to whom, um, a man who was around in the days of Isaiah, of course, and to whom uh, Isaiah went to help. And remember that in those days, the, the king of the Assyrians, Sennacherib, came and uh, invaded the land and was very threatening to the people there in the southern kingdom of Judah. And eventually sent a message, a letter, an ultimatum, saying, it's time you gave in. It's time you capitulated. It's time you recognize that I have ultimate power and that if you don't give in, your city will be devastated, like I've devastated so many other cities. So what does Hezekiah do? He received the letter from the hands of the messengers, went to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. That's in Isaiah 37. Here was a man who inquired of the Lord. And the folly of people in the northern kingdom was that they didn't. The arrogance led them to an increasing disobedience to the word of God. Instead of guiding the people, the prophets were leading them astray. So we have this grim picture of God's wrath against a society that had become totally corrupt in its universal disobedience. Did you notice that? That we read that everyone is godless. Every mouth speaks folly. The problem was they were facing the wrong direction, looking to men and not to God. The problem was that they were getting the wrong direction from godless leaders and teachers. The problem was that they were going in the wrong direction, not towards God, but away from him. And so Isaiah exposes the folly of human wisdom. And we might say that the folly is still there today in nations, in societies, in organizations, in homes, maybe even in your heart. I can do it. I'm my own man. I can sort this out. I have the wisdom that I need. But God comes and says, no, you don't. That human wisdom is a folly. So let's move on to the third of these great stanzas of judgment. This one is in verses 18 to 21, and um, not the greatest of headings, but the ferocity of sin. Here we have a picture of sin and its effect in human society. We all saw last year, I think, was it? Maybe the year before. Those great fires raging in Australia where the, the fire raged for days. Everything in its path was swept up. Homes, properties, possessions, foliage, trees, wildlife, everything burned. And we saw then an almost lunar landscape left black and absolutely lifeless, so it seems. And says Isaiah, it's just going to be like that. When sin gets hold of society, wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It kindles the thickets of the forest and they roll upwards in a column of smoke. 
And the people, well, they're just like fuel for the fire. And actually no one spares another. They slice meat on the right and they're still hungry. They devour on the left, but they're not satisfied. Each devours the flesh of his own arm. What a horrible thought. And Nasi devours Ephraim. Huh. These two lads, originally, Anasi and Ephraim, were the sons of Joseph. They had a, a very close relationship with one another. And so did their tribes, which grew out of them. But then comes the time where in the northern kingdom, Manasseh devours Ephraim, and Ephraim devours Manasseh. Together they are against Judah. There's squabbling, there's fighting, there's civil strife, there's even civil war. We could say here that this arrogance and disobedience of God's people has led to absolute anarchy. So much like the inspired commentary at the end of the book of Judges which reminds us that everyone did as he saw fit. And here even brother turns against brother. And we see that there is a kind of jungle morality going on. How awful it was. Wickedness carries within its bosom, says one commentator, the fire of its own destruction. I'm reminded of that little section in the book of James in the New Testament. James, probably the brother of our Lord Jesus, writing to Christians and says this, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Oh, adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Here is the ferocity of sin that has eaten like a cancer into human society to the point where brother is devouring brother and there is fighting left, right and centre. Instead of being a witness to the whole world, as Christian people are meant to be, by this shall you, all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. They were squabbling, fighting and killing. What ferocity there was all because of the rebellion of sin, the arrogance and the pride that there was in their society. We may say that sometimes human society still looks like that, doesn't it? Where we squabble and we fight. And we can look over at the war going on at the moment and think there's a great example of it, but we see it also in our hearts and minds. We squabble and we fight. We want, we covet, and we're prepared to argue and fight to get it. And God says, this is not the way that I would have you live. So we go from that stanza of judgment to the fourth and final one. And here he paints a picture of what you might call the fantasy of justice. It was meant to be a just and a an equitable society. It was meant to be a society ruled by the laws of God, where there was room for the fatherless and the widow and the orphan, where people had their place, their property, their status in society. But how different it had become. Here is blatant misrule. Here is oppression. Here is the semblance, but not the reality of justice, a pure fantasy. There were those who decreed iniquitous decrees. There were writers who kept writing oppression. There were those who turned aside the needy from justice and robbed the poor of their rights, who'd failed to look after the widows and made the fatherless their prey. These judges would one day face judgment themselves. And then what would they do? 
To whom would, then would they flee? Where then would they rely? On whom would they rely? And what would they do with their wealth? Nothing remains but to crouch among the prisoners or fall among the slain. For this, his anger is not turned away. Those who have abused justice in the courts are now in God's courts. And there are no escape routes left. The time of visitation and judgment was coming. And when that phrase comes, when we talk about the day of the Lord, here in verse 3, the day of punishment, we realise that something awful is going to happen. The glory of the people was their political position, but they'd lose it. Their wealth, but it would be gone. Their pride, but it would be destroyed. And the conquering nation would come into their land and they would be left with nothing. What a terrible end for a people who had had every blessing and assurance of life from God. But they had refused and refused and refused all that he had said to them and given to them. And by their conduct, they'd asked for the judgment that would now occur. So, what an awful, awful series of judgments upon God's people. But there's one final thing to say, I suppose, and it's this. That we need to think about not only the things we've looked at, but also about the finality of judgment. Hitherto in the book of Isaiah, God has certainly pointed the finger at his people and explained to them that they have failed in so many ways to honour him. But he's also given them the promise of redemption, that there would be a future, that there would be a remnant of those who would worship him and love him, and ultimately they would be the most wonderful redeemer. But here in these four little sections that we've looked at, as Isaiah points the finger at the northern kingdom of Israel, there is no hint of that redemption. But there is, however, a hint of the finality of judgment. For all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. We noted earlier that at the beginning of the war, the order was given on the wireless that church and chapel bells should stay silent, except to warn of imminent or actual invasion. Three years later, when that threat of invasion was largely over, that order was rescinded. And with effect from the 25th of April, Easter Sunday, 1943, bells could be rung again, this time to call people to worship and eventually to rejoice as victory was declared. But the morning bell for the passing of Israel would never be replaced by the bell of rejoicing. God was righteously angry with his people in the northern kingdom and would judge them for their studied indifference to him and their rejection of him. Ultimately, in 722 BC, Israel was taken captive by Assyria. Its people were deported and scattered, and its historic territory was repopulated with foreigners and others. Israel was never re-established. And the commentary on this is in 2 Kings chapter 17, where we read in verse 7, this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from out of the hand of Pharaoh, and had feared other gods, and had walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel, and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practised. And the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places. They set up for themselves pillars and asherim on every high hill. And they made offerings on all the high places as the nations did, whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger. He sent his prophets to them, but they would not listen. They were stubborn as their fathers had been, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They despised his statutes and his covenants. They abandoned all the commandments of the Lord their God. They even burned their sons and their daughters as offerings and used divination and omens and sold themselves to do evil. And so 
they face the judgment of God. They did not see fit to acknowledge God, and so he judged them for it. If you want an Old Testament, a New Testament example, then you'll find very similar words written by the Apostle Paul at the end of Romans chapter 1. He says this, the wrath of God is revealed against, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. He goes on to say that these people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonourable passions. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. And so the judgment of God will fall on the nation of Israel, as most certainly it will fall on those, all those, who disobey him, who reject his ways, who have no time for his teaching, who have no interest in his word who have no concern about his judgment. Was there no hope? Well, in the case of Israel, none at all. For an unrepentant people who were determined to have nothing to do with God, they faced a bleak future which neither they nor anyone else could prevent. Do you know it's just the same for us? We know that it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And we cannot prevent that from happening. We know that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And no one, not one of us, will be able to escape from that. Is there no hope? Well, praise God, there is. The Apostle Paul says, writing to the Corinthians, now is the favourable time. Now is the day of salvation. One day, maybe even later today for someone here, that day will be gone. That opportunity will be lost and lost forever. But now is the day of salvation. There is hope for those who turn to God, who hear his word, who fear his judgment, who embrace his son, who seek to follow his ways. So will you do that? Will you turn to God in repentance and faith? There will come the time when it will be too late and the day of opportunity will be past. But it is available here today. And for that, we praise God. That's a moment of quiet uh, prayer as we reflect upon the words we've heard, which have been tough, but we have the note of God's gracious invitation to us at the end uh, to, to come to him. He doesn't want to be angry with us. He wants us to know his love. So if that's you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, perhaps use this time now to come to him and ask him to come into your life. Repent of your sins and, and then tell somebody you've done that afterwards. So just a moment of quietness before we sing our last hymn. Paul says in Romans 11, if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness 
and the severity of God. Severity towards those who've fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. So let's express to God that we're going to continue in his kindness in our, our last hymn. I love the first couple of lines. God made me for himself to serve him here with love's pure service and in childlike fear. We never forget that he's a holy God, but we trust him now, don't we? And we submit to him. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>